questions. As we give people a chance to do that, uh, we have not done one of these since last week, and it was sort of right in the middle of mini camp where we'd had a practice, and then our show was actually in the middle of the second practice, and then we had one more after that. So we gave some of the initial mini camp thoughts last week, but I wanted to hear sort of now that it's wrapped up, uh, you've heard a little bit more from the media, saw another practice. What are your big picture kind of takeaways from the mini camp? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it because I think it's the big picture stuff that that you should take away from something like that. Three days of practice, you know, not, hey, Chris Godwin made a, a nice catch on the sideline or something like that. I mean, obviously that he's going to do that. But um, one of the big picture things is teams in pretty good health. I mean, there were six guys that weren't practicing when the camp for most of the camp, just six out of 89. And um, Tom Brady was not one of those. He was going full speed. Uh, and then one other player, a safety name, Curtis Riley, got hurt during camp. But the Riley injury is a little unsure at this point. Last we heard, he had an Achilles thing. and went, Coach Arians wasn't sure if he needed surgery or not. But everybody else, um, from Jordan Whitehead being a couple weeks away to Jalen Darden being very close to returning, all the other six guys, Coach said, would be no problem for training camp. So the Bucks should enter training camp in really good shape. And, and you know, along those same lines, you know, it's kind of a disjointed offseason, right? I mean, not a lot. You know, the OTAs were mostly just young guys. Veterans were working out with Tom Brady. Um, you know, we were finding out along the way uh, what we we're going to be able to do. There was fewer OTAs than ever before. And so you could have expected possibly when the team, the whole team for the first time since the Super Bowl gets back on the practice field to practice, that it would be a little ragged, right? But they looked pretty good. I mean, the Bucks looked, according to Bruce Arians, uh, like they're where they need to be heading into training camp. And, you know, I, that probably says a lot about what teams need to do in the off season. Um, and I'm not sure coaches and players completely agree on the final answer there, but uh, I think it's just my biggest takeaway is that the Bucks are in good health and ready to go for the start of training camp. And I, I feel like a lot of times we're talking about position battles that are happening in, in mini camp and that we're looking forward to in training camp. Now, when you return, all 22 starters, all three specialists. Uh, I don't know that that debate is quite as spicy as it has been in, in years past, um, but what are some of the position battles that could still happen, whether it is for a starting spot, as slim as that might seem, or just those roster spots down there at the you know 51, yeah. two, three area? It's definitely the latter. Um, and I think it was on the last day on Thursday, uh, Coach Arians after practice said something about some pretty good battles. And I think somebody in the crowd misunderstood a little bit and asked a follow-up question like, what, what starting spots are you talking about being up for competition? And Bruce said, oh, no, no, not, not starting spots. Those are pretty much set. And, and coaches don't say that a lot. They like to say, hey, every spot's open for competition. Right. But I mean, we're being realistic here. So we're talking about um, a little bit farther down the depth chart spots, but they're still important. Those are still important battles and they're still going to be fought pretty fiercely. Like, um, well, for, you know, for one, there's a pretty much what looks like a one-on-one -on -one battle for the punt return job between the veteran Jaden Mickens and the rookie Jalen Darden. But then there's also like the fifth cornerback or will there be six cornerbacks? Um, the, you know, the safety position, the depth there after Andrew Adams was one of the few guys that left, like, you know, a corner, they liked Herb Miller a lot. They elevated him for the practice squad several times last year. And, and I think he'll be battling to maybe get an actual spot on the 53 man roster this time. You know, you got the rookie, Chris Wilcox, the six round draft pick. And then they added some veterans, including Antonio Hamilton, who was on the chiefs during the super bowl and has really played a lot of football and would help right away on special teams. So there's, there's going to be a lot of competition there at safety. You got Raven green from the Packers who really did some pretty good work for green Bay, just had a little trouble staying on the field, uh, you know, due to injuries, which is why they let him go or didn't sign him as a restricted free agent. And then of course, as I said, uh, another one of those Curtis Riley, another one of those safeties got hurt. So that kind of muddies the picture a little bit. And then coach said Javon Hagen last year, who was, who was a guy who spent the entire season on the practice squad, did get to play a little bit in the NFC championship game. Um, he said he came in, had lost some weight and was in really good shape. So, and the secondary, I think there's going to be a lot of good battles to sort of round out the back end of that. Yeah, that always makes training camp fun to have some of those storylines to watch as guys battle it out. Um, okay, so Richard asked, um, who has a better chance for defensive player of the year, Shaq Barrett or Devin White? And then I thought I'd expand it and just ask you of our whole defense, are, are those the two top candidates you would suggest? Or if you were to say that the person on our defense most likely to win defensive player of the year, who would it be? Yeah, I think he has done a very good job of, of nailing the top two candidates there because um, generally, most of the time, the defensive player of the year does go to a guy who gets a lot of sacks. 
And uh, Shaq Barrett is, is the best bet for us to put up huge sack numbers. He also is very setting very, very ambitious goals for this season. He even mentioned wanting to be defensive player of the year, uh, wanting to prove he's the best, uh, one of the best uh, edge rushers in the entire league. He's definitely motivated. Um, and But then Devin White probably on paper would have the best shot because he's a guy that's really going to fill up the, uh, the whole stat line. So like last year, nine sacks, that's pretty remarkable for an off the ball linebacker. And they tended to come in bunches for him. So it's hard to say if he'll produce that again, but if Devin white hits double digit sacks somehow and has 150 tackles and maybe throws in a couple, um, a couple of turnovers, interceptions, a touchdown, like when Derek Brooks won it in 2002, he had five, I think four in the regular season, defensive touchdowns I mean that kind of big play probably because of the position he plays Devin White has the best chance to be the buck to rack up rack up those type of plays yeah so that I, I, I'd, I'd put him at the top of the list yeah that makes sense uh, Daniel said who are our dark horse picks for the biggest surprise to turn heads this year bucks always seem to find that gym in the rough yeah uh, a gym in the rough like are we talking about like a Adam Humphreys kind of thing or, or. Oh yeah. I think that might be who he's referencing in terms of our ability to find some guys like a Cam Brader and Adam Humphreys, but it, it may not need to be that level, especially because like we said, our starting spots are, are pretty locked up where you yeah. may not have a guy go from diamond in the rough to, you know, super productive starter, but just maybe somebody that, that could turn heads that people have not expected to do so quite yet. Um, well, it's, it's just tough because it's hard to see where guys are going to break through. Like a guy I'd like to see a little bit more of is Cam Gill, but the Buccaneers did just draft another player at his position uh, in Joe Tryon, who's probably going to get first crack at, at, you know, breaking that rotation, but I could still see Gill making the team. Larry foot, it says he's already lobbying to keep five outside linebackers when he was kept to four for most of last season. So um, Gill would probably be battling Quentin bell for the fifth one there. Uh, well, that's, that's a tough question. Otherwise, um, you know. Yeah, I was thinking maybe uh, Grant Stewart because of the special teams contributions that he's this kind of known for being a big hitter guy that because we lost Ryan Smith and, you know, he was kind of our special teams darling that that maybe that that is one of the few spots that someone could make some big splash plays that people hadn't really heard of. I mean, when you're when your title is Mr. Irrelevant, any <laughs> any big splash plays you end up making seems like you could qualify for that diamond in the rough. Category. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't thinking along the lines of special teams. So that does make some sense since, you know, it's it's not often that a special teams player becomes, you know, one of your team's most recognizable guys. But it happens like Matthew Slater in New England. I, I can remember the good old days of Kenny, Kenny the Shark Gant here in Tampa. And he used to make a lot of plays with special teams and the crowd really loved him. So I could see a guy maybe, you know, breaking through in that way. Yeah, I just remembered Ryan Smith getting turned into a meme after that leaning play. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> saving the ball from the end zone. And yeah, so so a few of those plays like that, and all of a sudden you become more of a name for your special teams contribution. Um, I thought this was an interesting question. Mike asked, who is our next rising star on the coaching staff outside of Left Witch and Bowles? Hmm. <laughs> you, just, you, you took the two obvious answers, right? Right. Yeah. And I think you can make us work on the list. Well, I think my answer might be Kevin Garver. Okay. That he's a guy that's still, you know, young. And I think the athletic maybe named him to their list of the like 40 under 40, kind of like influencing the, the direction of the league and all that. And I mean, you know, he already did work with Larry Fitzgerald in Arizona. That seemed to go pretty well. Although maybe Larry Fitzgerald was just a ready-made, you know, like yeah. already prepared to be an amazing player. But, and then of course he's, he's done some amazing things here with a very loaded wide receiver room. I, I feel like he's a guy that now has worked with so much talent that he, that, that could give you some, some kudos around the league and maybe be a bit of a rising star. What about a guy like Casey Rogers, the defensive line coach, who instead of thinking this is like who's the next possible um, head coach on this roster, you, you go through the progression. Like if Todd Bowles gets a head coaching job, could Casey Rogers be in line to potentially be the next defensive coordinator? Yeah, I think didn't I think Casey just won um, yeah. defensive line coach of the year, right? Yeah, he won some award for his coaching. So yeah. I think he's probably a really good answer to that. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, our next one was. Uh, from Mitch, and he asked, um, 
or wait, no, I read the wrong one. Michael, Michael asked, does Kyle Trask look capable of being a starter after Brady leaves? Well, we no, no, not yet. I mean, we definitely haven't seen enough of him to know that yet. That's obviously what the team is hoping happens. And he's done some impressive things and he's looked like a rookie at times, but it's such a small sample size that, um, yeah, I don't think we can declare that yet. You can say though, that he fits the mold of what the Buccaneers were looking for that for in a developmental quarterback. I think they like his arm and his, his style of play and his brains. And, and um, I, I just think he's a guy as, as coach Christensen said, they're going to be bringing him along very deliberately and slowly. And that's the way he's choosing to learn right now. So it's going to be a while till we can make proclamations like that, but I do think that is sort of a tentative plan for the okay. succession and we'll see if it works out. Okay. And we'll close with this one. Brandon asked, who is your, who do you think will be the MVP of the Bucks this next year? And I'm going to add a caveat that you can't answer Tom Brady just okay. because that's too simple. I would have said Tom Brady. Right. So outside <laughs> of that, who's probably, your I mean, I'll just circle back to what we were talking about before Devin white. I mean, if he takes another step forward as a, as a, impact defender he's going to be one of the most impactful defenders in the nfl and if the buccaneers defense plays like it did in the super bowl especially uh and really becomes less of a b-side to this whole tom brady story and more of like hey the defense here is as responsible for the buccaneers being super bowl contenders again as tom brady in the offense then there's going to be a lot of eyes on that defense. There's going to be people looking for, okay, who's the linchpin here. And, and Devin white just seems like a guy who could take it to another level, uh, throw in a lot more splash plays. And at the end of the day, you're going, well, we can't pick Tom Brady. Okay. Then I think it's probably Devin white. I like that. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us on this edition of Buccaneers insider live presented by Miller light. Thanks as always for being with us and for those great questions. And we'll see you next week.